Over 4 million African cashew farmers feed their families by harvesting local cashews that make up 57% of the world's supply. But the lion's share of the profit in this $4 billion industry goes elsewhere. 90% of cashews are shipped out of the continent to be processed and resold at a markup to the major snack vendors in North America and Europe. If an effective monitoring system can be put in place, Africans can retain the prosperity of their own resources. Jeremy Holt, CEO of Amberwood Trading, is working to make this happen. A veteran of the cashew business for over a decade, he is also a self-taught programmer. RavenDB was so easy for him to use, he taught himself using our free learning resources. He uses RavenDB to create a control system for each stage in every cashew transaction to produce full transparency for every document needed to conduct a cashew sale. This builds trust between buyers and sellers. It injects liquidity into the local markets via bank loans and expanded futures contracts, enabling farmers to expand their operations and capitalize on the double-digit demand growth for cashews worldwide. Today, RavenDB CEO Oren Aini speaks with Jeremy about how he is using RavenDB and his applications to make a huge difference in the lives of millions of African farmers and their families. Feel free to ask questions by clicking the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, and Oren and Jeremy will be happy to answer them throughout the session. Enjoy your presentation, and here's Oren. Hi, everyone. I'm really happy to be here with Jeremy. Uh, Jeremy, can you hear us? Uh, Jeremy has been a user of Revenue for quite some time, and he has an interesting scenario because what he's dealing with is mostly related to complexity of data and management of that rather than a, the amount of data in the scale of uh, Jeremy, with us? Yep. Yes, I'm with you. Hi. So I thought about just starting this conversation by, tell us what you do. Okay, well, um, I'm a commodity trader. Um, my background uh, goes back uh, nearly 40 years, uh, primarily in the nuts business. And I spent 25 years living in Brazil, and over the last four years, I've been living in Africa. A year in Ghana, and the last three years in uh, Cote d'Ivoire. Um, I am basically a consultant to the, cash, the new cashew uh, uh, industry, which is uh, growing up. Um, and I write software occasionally <laughs> to try and help uh, both um, the financial institutions and the factories um, express themselves better when they need to describe what it is that they actually do, particularly in respect of trying to obtain financing. So, so what do you mean by that? If I have a a cashew farm or a factory. Mm. Uh, what what is the term here? Okay, well, uh, let me try and give you an example. Let's say that you want to build a, um, a factory. That uh, I'm trying to think of a, set of, a of a good example. Let's say that you go to a bank and you want to build a new hospital. Okay, mm -hmm. all right. It is assumed that the people that you're speaking to at the bank know what are the requirements of the hospital. Um, they would understand that if you require you know, so many beds, that they would have some kind of specialist inside the bank that would be able to evaluate your project. And that is true of uh, most uh, um, financial If I go to a bank asking for a loan to open a restaurant, they're going to tell me no because they know that most restaurants fail. But if I'm going to open, yeah, I mean, you know. No, we'll take a step back. No, we'll take yeah. a step back. Mm -hmm. Let's say that you are a, um, a world reclaimed chef and you go to mm -hmm. a bank and you say, I want to open a restaurant mm -hmm. and, I want, and I want to put in 20 tables and 60 chairs. Mm -hmm. Assuming that the bank already has some experience of lending money to the restaurants, you know, they will ask you pertinent questions um, they will ask you, um, who is your target market? What kind of food are you going to sell? Who are your suppliers going to be? And then they will have their own expertise in-house to be able to evaluate the answers that you've given. Okay. okay. Um, they may well take a decision that, yes, okay, we're at the end of the world now, so uh, restaurants, the restaurant business is a bad business. 
and I'm not going to lend you the money. But the point is that within um, within the bank itself, um, and this indeed, is an informed the, decision. It's an informed decision because they will have prior experience of having mm -hmm. financed people who want to build banks. Even if in the st in the in the step prior to that, if you call up your uh, your accountant or your business consultant and ask him to draw up a business plan. Uh, one assumes that he already has some experience of the restaurant business. And so uh, he will guide you as to how best to present your business case to the bank. Okay. So this works on the, on the premise that there is already prior knowledge in place. Now, when we start looking at the cashew sector in Africa, unfortunately, there is no, I don't want to say there is no prior knowledge, but there is almost, there is very, very little prior knowledge. So um, a cashew factory is uh, a complicated factory. Um, there are a lot of processes involved uh, from taking the raw cashews, which come off the tree from the farmer, removing the shell, uh, removing the inner peel, uh, grading the nuts out by size and by color, packing it, making sure that it's in conformity with food safety requirements, uh, specifically in the US that it's in conformity with FISMA, the Food Safety Modernization Act. Um, the logistics of getting the stuff, getting the cashews into containers, getting them on board vessels and getting them to the final buyer, wherever it may be in the US, in, uh, in Europe and such like. Now, that technical aspect, um, the knowledge of that technical aspect of uh, cashew processing basically doesn't exist. It certainly doesn't exist amongst the African banks. And the reason it doesn't exist is because they've never done it before. So, you know, it's not that it's a, an overt criticism of, uh, of the banks per se. It is simply the experience doesn't exist. And if we look at Africa as, um, um, as a source of uh, raw material, um, uh, as David said in the introduction, uh, it represents about 57% of the global supply of the raw cashews, but only about 10% is actually processed in Africa. The rest of the stuff is shipped to either India or to Vietnam, where it's, where it's processed, meaning they remove the shell, they remove the skin, they do all the grading and such like as I've already described. And then they will reship that uh, uh, the, the finished product to the fine to the main destination. So basically, Europe, uh, the USA, uh, the Middle East, um, and uh, China. So um, what we have here in Africa, and I've got to be careful. I can't generalize too much because I'm based in Cote d'Ivoire. So I know Cote d'Ivoire very well. I don't know. And I know Ghana fairly well, but I don't know the other West African countries that well. So um, I'll sort of concentrate on the situation here, but I don't think it's that much different in other parts of West Africa. So basically, because the processing industry is a new industry, um, we don't have prior experience. Um, neither the banks nor the entrepreneurs who want to build uh, new factories. What we do have, though, is we have 26% of the entire global production of raw cashews comes from this one country, comes from Cote d'Ivoire. And in the surrounding West African countries, um, it represents about 35% of total global production. So that is uh, Cote d'Ivoire. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's huge. It's enormous. It's enormous. And if you so, think about the logistics mm -hmm. of of collecting, as it is here, a million tons of cashews. Just <laughs> It's a lot of stuff, okay? And then putting it into containers and then shipping it to uh, Vietnam or to India, having it then processed in a factory in Vietnam and then shipped back to Europe or to the USA. You can imagine the scale of the logistics. And you can also understand why there is a desire to build a local industry to process it here because it creates labor, um, or rather it creates jobs. Um, you don't get a deterioration of quality as the, as the product moves from one side of the world to the other. Um, the cost of labor, in fact, here is actually a lot more expensive than in Vietnam. But then, 
you know, that sort of, it's a bit. But thinking about the logistics of shipping halfway around the world and ship it back out. Exactly. And the time for involved is uh, a huge additional cost. But of course. Yeah. Okay, so this is the busiest problem thing. Now, yeah. given your experience, I assume that you can come in, look at the factory, and uh, pull up an express spreadsheet and give us some numbers. But uh, you went beyond that. Yes. Can you, so now that we understand the problem, well, what are we looking at in terms of your solution? What do, we, what do you bring to the table? Okay, well, basically I created two solutions, but this, the, the one that I'd prefer to talk about is the more important one, which is I spent the first three years that I was here going around and visiting banks, visiting factories, and trying to understand what the problem was, because the bottleneck is that the, the, the Ivorian government announced a few years ago that they wanted 50% of the crop to be processed locally. So everyone thought it was a splendid idea and off they went and they went off wherever they could and they bought machines. The banks were more than happy to finance them. And almost without exception, every single one of those factories failed and the banks all lost money because they didn't get their money repaid. And banks being banks, whether they're African or Israeli or American banks, when they lose money once, yeah. um, <laughs> they, don't, they never want to admit, first of all, that they made the mistake. Um, and they have simply pulled all lines of finance. So now you cannot get, uh, it's extremely difficult to get financing from banks. And um, what is quite remarkable is that, well, I guess you've been to a bank uh, uh, to borrow money in the past. You know how many thousands of stupid questions they ask you. Maybe oh, there's a few. Yes a few intelligent ones, and of course, they describe that as doing their, doing their due diligence. Mm -hmm. um, and the problem is that if we go back to the restaurant example, okay, you know, there's two aspects to the bank manager, not the bank manager, but the credit committee deciding whether they're going to lend you the money. One is that you can show them this is going to be uh, my income, these are my expenses, this is my anticipated profit. I will be able to pay you back over a certain period of time. Um, so I can pay uh, the bank their interest, uh, then I can start paying the capital. That's one aspect, that's the financial aspect of, uh, mm -hmm. of the loan. But the other part, which is equally important, if not more important, is uh, do you know what you're doing? You know, um, uh, do you know how to cook? Do you know where to buy the right ingredients? Um, do you know how to buy you know, which um, I don't know, chopping machine are you going to buy? Are you going to buy a really cheap one that falls apart in a couple of years? Or are you going to buy, you know, a more expensive one that will last you for 10 years? So that aspect, the technical aspect, is of equal importance to the financial aspect. And this is where the banks and the businessmen here have all fallen down. They haven't been able to, the banks never asked the right questions because they didn't know that they had to ask those questions. The businessmen who came into building cashew factories primarily come from the cocoa industry. And um, without getting too involved in uh, the Ivorian economy, um, the Ivory Coast is the biggest producer of cocoa in the world as well. It produces about 2 million tons, but it doesn't do any processing here at all. What it does is re-cleaning. So it brings in from the farm the dirty cocoa beans, and then they'll dry them in, in, in uh, uh, drying facilities, clean them up a little bit, and put the cocoa beans in new, new jute bags, and then ship them to Europe or to the US where that is transformed into chocolate. So the final processing is not done here at all. It's done in, if you want, in the developed world. Now, so in this um, case, all of so what you're saying is all of the expertise in processing is in uh, is external. It's not uh, local exactly. to the region. Exactly. And exactly. that that led okay. So I understand. I understand what the problem is. Okay. What is so you you're a programmer or you're a software programmer. And you come up with a solution. I'm looking at a, a RevenDB document in front of me and I see 
something here and I have no idea what I'm looking at. <laughs> okay, so, so the problem is, mm -hmm. the, the way that I defined the problem, mm -hmm. was that the technical aspects of processing weren't being, uh, weren't being addressed by either the financier or by the businessman who wanted to build a factory. And all the calculations that evidently were being done were back of envelope um, calculations. Um, now, um, again, you, know, you don't have to know very much about the cashy business to, to realize that if the quality is slightly different, if the moisture content is slightly different, you know, all of this will have a dramatic effect on your bottom line. Um, and so, you know, these, the, the variables of which there are, I've never bothered to adding them all up, but there must be 70 or 80 different variables. Each one of itself has a dramatic effect on, on the final figure. And each one is interlinked to another. Um, and if you are unable to visualize how one variable affects the other variable, which ultimately affects your bottom line, you know, doing it on the back of an envelope isn't going to give you the answer. So I wrote this application. Initially, I'd started it as a spreadsheet in Excel because really this is nothing more. There's all that. such things start. Yes, <laughs> exactly. But, you know, you can imagine it starts getting very, very complicated very quickly because there are a tremendous number of calculations that uh, uh -huh. have to be done. And because I wanted the application to sort of be live, so in other words, you could use it like a spreadsheet, um, and that you could ask, you know, the banker or the, the financial advisor um, or indeed the customer, you know, they could sit there and say, hey, well, what happens if the moisture, you know, if it rains this month or if it rains in May, you know, how will that affect my bottom line? Because that has a dramatic effect that increases the moisture content, which means you're paying the farmer for water together with the raw material, which means you have to dry the nuts, which means you have more labor, which means uh, your quality deteriorates, which means the number of cartons of finished cashews becomes less. And so you can see something as apparently insignificant as is it raining or not has a dramatic effect on the bottom line. So what you're looking at is just one part of um, each one of these, which are called costings are actually um, a factory, okay? So, I don't know, can you see my screen? If I oh, we can see it? your screen, yes. Okay. Uh, may I suggest, can you show us the app first? Because this looks scary and it might be easier if you see the... Oh, so uh, you want to see the finished result? Yeah. Okay, okay, so... Okay, so this is an example um, of one of our factories that uh, we were working with. Um, I see what you said, it looks like Excel. Yes, it is, Excel. it is, it's a spreadsheet, um, you know, it, it's, mm -hmm. um, okay, so I don't, I won't go through every single line, but um, essentially what, what we're doing here is it's taking in the, the, raw, the raw cashew nuts, RCN is raw cashew nut purchases, um, on an annual basis, so this is the quantity in tons that this factory is going to process. Uh, the next line works out, it says, okay, we're going to be buying 15% in April, in March, 20% in April, and so on and so forth. Um, these are the prices in, uh, in um, uh, CIFA, the local currency here. The KOR is, is um, an indicator of quality. Um, the next line is the moisture content. So this is how much moisture you will lose. If you look at this, in fact, March, April, and May is the rainy season, okay? Uh -huh. So we have a higher moisture content. It then goes on to calculate the theoretical yield, which is how many, mm -hmm. which is the percentage of cashew kernels mm -hmm. that you will get from, um, from the raw cashews, okay? It then, then we get down to this, the start of the interesting stuff, which is this is the, the purchases is how many tons you're going to be buying, um, per month, okay? That's from and the farm. Down, yes, that's uh, precisely. That's how much stuff. So, for example, in March, you'll be receiving, you'll be buying 1,800 tons of raw cashews. Mm -hmm. You'll need to, you'll need 1.4 million dollars to to buy that. And okay? that's used for the 
financial computation. Of course. I got a uh, exactly. $10 million loan, and this is when I'm going to need every uh, bit of this financing. Precisely, okay. Mm -hmm. Then it calculates how much you've lost in moisture, which is water. Um, and then it calculates how much raw cash, how, uh, what quantity of raw cash is actually enters the warehouse. Now, the, if I go to year two, because year one assumes that you've got a slow startup. So we're in year two now, and we've had a few months of processing in place. Okay. Now, um, if one goes down to the production section, okay, you have machines which have to grade the raw cashews as they come in. And, and you can see the, we have the maximum grading capacity. So that is your upper limit as to how much you can actually process. Um, you then have a capacity of your machines, which is how much they can actually shell. Um, mm -hmm. And so the rest of this is all the calculations that are done to determine how much you have inside the factory at any one time, how much is in the warehouse waiting to be graded, um, how much has been graded, um, waiting to go into production, and so on and so forth. Um, the shell, which if you come down to the bottom of this section where I am, can you see my cursor? Yes. Um, Okay, so 55% of the cash unit is shell. Okay. Um, and that also produces, you know, it's quite a big problem of how you dispose of the shell because there isn't a lot of usage for it. Um, what do you do with that? It's well, waste? it's a good question. You see, within the shell is a, is a product called CNSL, cash unit shell liquid. And from cash unit shell liquid, you can extract cardinal. And cardinal is used to make friction dust, which is what you find on the brake linings of cars. <laughs> I'm okay. sorry, that, that just came up from out of nowhere for me. Okay, well, it's, it's extremely interesting because over the years, um, the cardinal is now extracted from petroleum, but for jet fighters um, and for very, and for, for very far up as the racing cars, the synthetically produced friction dust isn't good enough. You still have to use cashew nut shell liquid in order to produce the cardinal, in order to produce the final products for the brake linings of high performance vehicles. <laughs> so there you go. Okay, now it's highly combustible as well, and it's got a horrible smell, horrible taste. Um, and it's an acid, basically. It's a uh, Gosh, I can't remember the name now. So um, what do you do with the shell? Well, you know, here they try to sort of uh, compact it and sell it um, as fuel, but because it retains a lot of this uh, cash in our shell liquid, it imparts a fairly nasty smell to the food uh, mm -hmm. if you're going to cook on it. Um, it's a real problem. It's a real problem disposing okay. of 55% of the crop. So imagine, that's 550,000 tons of this stuff we have to get rid of every year. Okay, yeah, so it's a I big problem. <laughs> I'm sorry, my mind doesn't work in these numbers. Right. You keep, you keep throwing uh, uh, hundreds of thousands and then adding tons of nothing, that's too hard. Right, but, okay. Uh, so I'm looking at this, um, I'm a, at Harp, I'm a developer, I'm looking at this, I'm saying, okay, how would I be uh, implementing that? Uh, Sorry, how, 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 how would I go about implementing something like this? Because I assume that, uh, let's say that uh, I'm looking at the RC and max grading capacity, which is the mm -hmm. cost line on production. Let's say that I'm planning on a, Year two, February, I'm going to get a new machine, which is going to give me additional grading capacity. So I have the ability to add that in, and instead of uh, 1575, we'll have 1600. Exactly, yes. And okay. that has an impact of everything. And I will also need to include the cost of the machine and the payment of that and all sorts of stuff. Precisely. Okay. Look at so... this, that's a whole lot of numbers a lot of data that I need to work in and store. If you yes, no. the initial database here, that's probably mean that I'm going to throw that into, uh, I think that the term I'm looking for is a metric ton of tables. 
<laughs> yeah. uh, and that's expensive. Um, that's expensive in terms of the system performance. And in your case, I don't think that there are going to be ever, you know, 100 million cash factories in South Africa that you need to worry about. But no. um, so the, the size of the data isn't that meaningful, but the complexity is. And I'm trying to think about how they go about doing something like this. And uh, the developer time in order to resolve that is huge. So can you tell me about, and you know, I'll hear about in the RevenDB uh, webinar. So can you tell me about how you decided to use RevenDB and what sort of experiences would like? Using Raven, well, you know, I mean, <laughs> I've been using Raven since version one, I think. Um, uh, but, you know, prior to that, I used SQL. I, never, I was never very comfortable with that with SQL Server. And then Raven came along. And, um, How you know, did it, you it? Oh, I don't know, since Raven 1 came out. So. Oh, dear God, that's 10 years. Is it? Really? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, what's the date? So the edge right now is uh, May 13. If I remember properly, Revenue was released in May 18, 2020. Uh, 2010. Okay. <laughs> really? Is that long? Oh my goodness. Yeah. Oh, well, I could probably count it by the number. I could probably count it by the number of gray hairs on my head. Um, so if you have only 10, you're great. No, well, I wish, I wish. But um, I, it, it took me a long time to to get the concept of a document database. Um, I understood it when I read it, but it was one of those things that you read about it and then you sit down and try and, and model things. And, uh, you know, it's it's very difficult, well, as, you, as I'm sure, you know, you know, you know to move from, uh, from the concept of, um, you know, databases with, um, uh, with foreign keys and all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, I think one of the things that really made things very clear to me is in one of the documents, of course, in those days, you didn't have much in the way of documentation, did you, uh, Oren? But, um, <laughs> we, <laughs> we actually had a whole documentation. We try, that's just a uh, side note. And yeah, okay. Didn't care about that. We tried getting developers to write documentation and it just never worked. Even when I took away the ID, the no Visual Studio for you, go and write documentation, they still manage, oh, this is an emergency bug, I have to fix the possible thing. Yeah. Eventually, I just said, okay, we, we hire the documentation team and the situation is much, much, much better. Well, I think the truth is that I learned far more from Google Groups, from the Raven Google Groups than, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I mean, uh, you know, shout out to everybody on there. I can't remember everybody's names that, you know, really helped. But, you know, obviously you, but there are all kinds of people there who had the most incredible patience and still do. Um, I don't use it as much because I don't have so many stupid questions to ask any longer. But um, um, the thing that, you know, that finally made me understand the concept of um, documents, uh, a document database is the example that you give even in the current documentation of, you know, having a customer with his name and address, um, and instead of having a foreign key to the customer for, uh, uh, and his address, you know, uh, that when the customer's name changes, for example, or his address changes, that updates your entire system. Um, but in fact, that is an intrinsic part of the document. And if you lived at, you know, that particular address at that moment in time, then, um, that is actually a recording of the data. Um, I'm not explaining myself very well, but you know what I mean, don't you? Um, so, you know, it's funny actually, because this particular program is each factory, which is what you're looking at on the screen, is one document. And it started off as multiple documents. And I found that it actually made a lot more sense to put everything into one document. Um, and you know, because this is bounded data, it, it can't possibly grow any bigger than, I don't know what it is actually, it's... Um, uh, 100, kilo, 100 kilobytes. Yeah, it's about 100 kilobytes, okay. So it takes seconds, it takes seconds to open um, or to download over the internet. So, you know, for those seconds, it's, it's fine. 
um, you know, there's almost no writing to it what, uh, at all. Um, it's, uh, um, you know, so, so it's not, there's no question of performance here. It's just not an issue. Um, um, but I, what I do find is that when I'm writing different kinds of applications, you know, for example, I'm, uh, I'm in the process at the moment of writing a, a contracts uh, a system where, you know, it's a, it's a traditional uh, master header and detail type of thing. Then it doesn't make, you know, it's, it's not that it doesn't make sense to have um, all, all in one document. Sometimes it makes sense to split the documents up. And when I learned the the magic of load, um, you know, that you can include a document in your in your in your um, session load. Is that it? In your mm -hmm. session load. Um, you know, fantastic. You know, I suddenly realized that I had, you know, extra flexibility. Again, you know, as I, I want to make it very clear, I am not a program. Okay. I sort of learn things by accident. Um, and there's a lot of, I love that. Well, I'm not a pro, I'm not a programmer. And, you know, I get terribly embarrassed when I showed you my code. You know, what took me years to write, you did a code review in 15 minutes and completely humiliated me. So oh, dear. I'm yeah. still working through it, Oren, okay? <laughs> um, but, you know, going back to this particular thing, you asked about where all the data comes from. So let's look at a, um, a civil engineer, in which anyone who's seeing this should, should be able to identify what it's talking about, okay? So... This is where the data goes in. So these are the factory construction costs, the complete brickwork. We have units here, how much it costs uh, uh, per unit, um, the depreciation cost, the maintenance cost, supply description. So here we've got the steel structure for the factory, raw material warehouse construction costs, the land purchase, um, procurement fees. If I go to the machines, Okay, this is to build the raw material warehouse, the machines that I need, uh, Weybridge, which is forklifts, uh, big bags. Okay, so if I click on that. Um, also, hit down here in the payment schedule, uh, you know, when you buy, because this is a, this is a, a lay it's uh, just the machinery is $6.4 million. Okay. okay. Just the machinery on this, and this is a relatively small factory. But you don't pay out. You don't pay out. You don't pay it out to the supplier all at one time. So down here we've got a payment schedule because this affects dramatically your cash flow. You know, how much money you have to pay out every month? Okay. So again, sort of bit, it isn't technical, but it's you know this is the steam roasting, continuous steam roasting group, um, and so on and so forth. Okay. There's your cash nut shell extraction uh, unit. Your kernel drying mechanical peeling, so on and so forth, okay? Um, these are the services, so your air consumption, water consumption, electricity. These are your costs of sales. So if we look at kernels, okay, it's how much it costs to take uh, the kernels from the factory to the port, uh, the sales commission, the certificate of wage, the courier costs, customs declaration, um, Okay, this is your GNA, local travel expenses, IT, et cetera, et cetera. Your employees, so you have employees in each sector. How many senior management? What their salary is? Is there, are you paying them uh, food, transport, insurance? You can have it in, the, because we, here in Cote d'Ivoire, we work in euros, dollars, and CIFA. Um, and where it says currency, the reason it's currency and not specifically CIFA is that I envisage this being used in Nigeria where the currency is a Naira. So rather than tied into specifically CIFA, um, I've got a more generic currency for the, all of the West African uh, currency, uh, all the West African currencies. Here you have the number of supervisors. Down to, um, which is in the manual peeling. Okay, in fact, the program calculates how many staff that you require. And 
that is a fact, and I'll show you in a second, that is a factor of their efficiency, how well trained they have, what experience they have, and so on and so forth. And the, the as you can see here, the number of super... Advisors calculated, I believe, um, are calculated uh, automatically. Uh, the same goes for manual grading. So this is where the intensive part of the labor comes from. Okay. Um, okay. So here we have, oh, okay, production costs. So these are the cardboard boxes um, that the final cashews are, are packed in, and these are the bags that go into the boxes. Okay, so here, under production data, this is, this is if you like, the heart of the variables. Um, so we look at, you know, how many days per month, how many working days per month, how many hours per day each machine is going to different types of machines are going to operate, um, how many hours per day the workers are going to be operating. Um, this is the capacity of the cleaning and grading machines, which determines, if you recall, the number of, which is the intake capacity um, that the factory can receive. And it goes on and on and on. So how many kilos per hour can each cutting machine cut? Um, and cut in that sense means, if you can imagine, well, you've probably never seen a raw cashew nut, but <laughs> <laughs> basically you have to uh, line it up. It looks like a kidney. So if you can imagine you have to line it up and then you have a special machine which brings a blade down and it goes through the shell, twists a little bit and the kernel theoretically pops out. So um, what it's doing here is it's calculating its capacity of tons per day. And where is that? Uh behind this. Sorry? So you're showing me a lot of uh, uh, details. All of this right. is in the costing document? Yes, all of this, all of this data it goes okay. in, in the costing document, exactly. So okay. in order to, so I'm trying to think about the architecture behind this. In order to make a computation, what you're actually doing is load a document which represents the entire set of the factory. Yep. And then you basically flow that state everywhere around the computation, etc. Precisely. Let me just see if I can... Uh, I don't know, is this going to work? Okay, so can you see both? Uh, yes. You see, but, okay, so let me just take, for example, mechanical grading. Where the hell is that? Um, Gosh, if I can remember where all this is. No, just you know, to keep it. I'm just looking at the. You have almost eight thousand lines of data here, and I'm looking at the number of items that we have here. So machine sell price, uh, sales cost, all of that, all of the employees that you have. That's a lot of data to to work with and manage. The, yes. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, okay. So you mentioned that, so we talked about already about some of the advantages of being able to do that. Uh, what was the uh, experience? I mean, you mentioned that it took you a while to go to get to, uh, uh, to fully get the, the document model and how to work with that. Uh, but can you, what was the team, what was the most, uh, what, what was the highlight in terms of uh, the things that matters when you work with Revenue on this project? Well, the okay, things well, that, that matter. Okay, so, I mean, the way I actually wrote this was I took each section of, of uh, the factory, first of all, and I thought about, well, what constitutes this particular section of the factory? Um, and within that, there are the machines, there are the costs, there are the labor. And I simply started um, uh, writing um, outline code in C Sharp, mm -hmm. uh, simply, simply describing what each thing does. And then I thought to myself, oh, hold on, 
I'm going to get my knickers in a twist if I carry on like this. So what I tried to do then was to create what is called here under machines an item. And it's basically, it's the descriptor that defines each separate, each individual aspect. And initially all I did was I just wrote tests which described what it was I was trying to do and refine the, not so much refine the test, but refine the codes so that I had a common way of describing each aspect of the, of the process. Um, so a machine, I think, if I remember right, actually looks like, um, no, hold on. A machine looks like that. I think it's civil engineering. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, all right, a production cost. A production cost looks like a machine, okay? So it was a way of trying to normalize the shape of the data and through, uh, you know, through uh, you know, the, the process of trial and error, if you want, in writing tests, the, uh, the code basically developed and I was able to write all of my calculations or, or, or test out my calculations. Um, and, you know, it's a system that evolves because, um, you know, you start doing one calculation and then you realize, oh, you know, this depends on another calculation, it depends on another. And then lo and behold, you know, all I had to do is um, at, the, at the end of my code, uh, write session, save, costing, and boom, I got myself a database for nothing. Um, okay. And at the start, I write session loads, and I've got myself a fully working database. All the indexes, I don't think there are any indexes in this particular database. You have eight, um, I think. Do, do I? Really? Uh, it looks like it, yeah. Oh, well, there you go. Um, okay. And in fact, some of them, by the way, look to be written by you. So there are some auto indexes that you have bundles by name by registration code. Yes, I don't think. Okay, so this is interesting because originally I wrote this to uh, the way this program was originally written was to be able to brand it for the individual banks. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of stupid complexity. Um, in that the Maybe idea was, to, do it for you. yeah, well, the idea was to sell it to the banks um, and have them in turn, uh, in fact, the original idea was that we would act as, as the technical consultant to the bank. The mm -hmm. bank would um, buy this program and then charge their customer. And the idea was that when the customer went on, they would see their bank on the screen. In the end, I mean, it worked, but in the end, I found that um, the banks just aren't that interested. They don't want to pay for, you know, for technical information because they don't want to admit they don't understand what they're looking at, which is daft. But anyway, so in fact, these indexes are, if you like, they're just sort of administrative things, and most of them don't actually uh, aren't actually used at all. Um, in fact, just looking at it now, I haven't looked at it for ages. Um, there, there aren't, you know, other than there aren't any indexes here really that um, that the application really uses. I mean, um, okay. you know, that's there's a, a big... from my perspective, that's good if you can do most of yeah. them without uh, that uh, query optimization. I'm afraid that's the best thing for you to be concerned about. Exactly. I mean, I, I, um, I. Uh, I avoid writing indexes because I'm always worried, you know, no, I'm worried, but I always get the names muddled up or, or I never have all the, all the names in, uh, you know, in the, uh, in the map and the reduce and then I have to go backwards and forwards, but thank so, goodness, all your, right. you know, the error messages now are so good that it's... Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we try. That, that's actually, uh, I don't know if you, well, you do remember, but uh, because you use it for well, but one of the things that we've done with the forwardist or was to work on the user experience of it. And the studies are obviously part of that, but error handling and error messages have been something that we put a lot of thought into. And it matters because if you get an error and it says, if fail, then you want to hit yourself over the head with something. If it tells you, 
oh, this step because so and so and do something like this and it works, then you have a path forward. And the level of aggravation experience is reduced. Uh, you mentioned earlier that you've used MapReduce. I don't think there are uh, any of them here, but I want to ask you what sort of features are you, uh, what sort of advanced features or uh, beyond load and save are you using in your application? Well, in this application, um, I didn't there are any advanced features whatsoever. This is simply a, mess, a, a means of just storing a lump of data, one mm -hmm. document. Um, I've got other databases here. Um, uh, which one is it? Which are a lot more complicated, much, much more complicated. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's this one. Actually, even this one, you see, uh, it's very little. Um, yeah, this is this is a bit more complicated. Um, but most of them are auto. In, uh, most of them are auto indices. Um, in fact, I'd say ninety nine percent are uh, auto indices. And That's if it, yeah. and if I write a map reduce, it's simply you know just giving me a simple sum on um, you know whatever it is, um, you know, it's just a simple uh, grouping and sum, even I can uh, write that. And that's about the extent of it. Um, what you showed me yesterday was fascinating, but oh, horrifically uh, complex. And <laughs> so to the uh, audience, what happened yesterday that was uh, Jeremy asked me a question and I tried answering that and I couldn't. Uh, I actually prepared in advance and I have an answer for you here. Uh, I'm going to share my screen and I would like you to, can you see my screen? Yep. Okay, uh, so what we have here is some transaction for some account and there are amounts for this account for different things that happen on this account. And Jeremy asked me to do some computation here. And do you want to tell me what the, what he wanted to run? Okay, well, basically, I mean, um, what I need at any one time, whether it's if I'm doing, you know, uh, uh, finance or stock, is I need to have an opening balance, um, a closing balance. Uh, so an opening balance for the previous month, um, the daily transactions that are, that are in there, and the running total of my stock or my money um, on a daily basis. So it adds itself. So let's say um, the March closing balance was 100. Um, and I have a transaction today of, um, let's say, plus five. I want to be able to see that my, my opening balance is 100. My current running balance is 105. The next day, let's say it's minus 20. So I then want to be able to show that on the, on the next day it's... 105 minus 20, and so on and so forth. So that's what you so, tried to do. Did yeah, I explain that? Well? Yeah. And I'm afraid uh, I tried to have you being simple, <laughs> but I, I have to admit, I went a little bit over the deep end trying to get this to work, and I couldn't. Uh, right. sometimes, sometimes you just get into a state where uh, it's not possible for you. you. You go so deep into one direction that it's not possible for you to actually see it. So, here is something, this is a very simple MapReduce index. And what this MapReduce index does is say, okay, per account in the day of the month, the first day, uh, sum the amount. So if I'm looking at here in uh, January, there was 73 uh, in the account, in February 40, uh, 48, and minus uh, negative 35. If I'm just looking at this information, it doesn't give me, I, I think that I'm going to lose money. I have negative amount here. This is just a multiple selection in that particular amount. I want to see the running total. So, yes. Now we can see something really interesting. This is 73, which matches 
what we previously have. So let's look at so this information is right now on the live database. So here's 73, and this one is now. Now I have 121, which is 73 plus 48. Does it make sense to me? 73 plus 48, but yes. Uh, and then negative 35, which gives us this number. Now, here is how I got this. Notice that this part is absolutely identical to what we had in the sum index. So the reduce is the same. The only difference is what you do in the map. And in the map, I'm saying, okay, for each transaction, I want to record it in the current month and the every month for the next 10 years. And this is how I'm able to actually do this sort of computation. So if you go ahead and look here, the running total, look at this one. See that I actually have a lot of reduced values for this index up to 2025. 20, uh, mm -hmm. So now I'm going to go here, look at this month. And here are a bunch of values for this month, which allows me to get to the, you see? So we compute all of the previous transactions mm -hmm. from the date they happened for. There are other ways of doing that. We can do that on using multiple indexes, but this is probably the easiest way to do that uh, for what we want. Now, if we have a lot of transactions, then this is going to stop being a simple value and become a hierarchy a tree, and then we're only going to modify some part of it. But uh, this is a nice uh, method to be able to say, okay, let's compute this, not just now, but also on the future as well. Mm. Uh, I think that we are just about out of time. So uh, I would like to open the floor for questions from the audience. If anyone has any questions, now is the time. While we're waiting for questions, uh, Jeremy, what would be your revenue be elevator pitch? I'm sorry, what would be my... What would, what would, be, what would be your elevator pitch for revenue be? Given that you have one minute to talk to someone to tell them about RavenDB, what would you tell them about? Sorry, what would I say about RavenDB? Yeah, um, to... yeah, it's for someone like me who's not a programmer, it's, uh, it's the perfect system because, you know, it's once you've got over the learning curve, it is, you know, it's dead simple to use. And the beauty is you don't have to think about it. Uh, if you can already code in C Sharp, which is my case, as I described, just by writing out models at the end of the day, you've got yourself a database. Obviously, from there, you can make it as complex as you want. And of course, you know, what you're showing in this particular example is, you know, is, is the end of the end or the top level of complexity. I don't, you know, I certainly don't think I'm representative of, of your audience or, uh, or programmers in general, because I'm a very, very bad programmer. But, uh, um, it's the fact that it's, it's so simple to use. Um, and it's, you know, it's, I haven't got the, I'm not using the five version, I'm using the four version at the moment, but it's so damn fast. It's, um, oh, the other thing that I love, love, love about it is when, um, I'm doing my unit tests, I can stop in the middle, um, and it brings up, um, um, the screen. Wait for, wait for user to continue the test. Wait for users to continue. Oh my yeah. goodness. When I discovered that, you could have probably heard me in Jerusalem. <laughs> uh. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's something that we actually uh, uh, did for our own benefit because I kept, I kept stopping all of the trades, uh, kept stopping the 
the trades on that are on the debugger, and then trying to look at the data is just a mess. And oh wait, yeah. we can do that by just writing this, and uh, that was a huge economic change for us. Yeah, I think you had it in. I think you had it in version three, maybe, or because it's it's not new. But I didn't yeah. think it worked very well in version three. But when I discovered that it works. Um, you know, there are two things, wait for indexing when you're right on, your, on your unit tests and this one, wait for user to continue. Because when you're, when you're modeling the data, uh, you, know, um, you know, obviously some of the hardest things are naming, coming up with, uh, with uh, sensible data values. Um, and to be able to visualize what it actually looks like, you know, my goodness, does that cut down the amount of time, you know, in, in not so much in debugging, but you know, in in being able to sort of rewrite the model. Um, you know, I mean, you shape it. It's like plasticity. You know, you're 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 you know, you start off with one thing, and then you just fiddle around with it. And it's this flexibility, um, you know, and the way that you can actually visualize it uh, is phenomenal. Uh, and I would say, if there's one, if that is. If, I, if you ask me what my favorite thing about uh, Raven is, it's that. Um, I don't use it very often, but when I do use it, um, you know, oh, my, it's, you know, it saves so much time. And it helps me not so much correct my errors, but it, it forces me to rethink, um, you know, the way the data should be looking. So, you know, that's the magic thing. Um, look, as I say, I'm not a very good example uh, of your of your of your customers because you know i looked at uh, mongo for 30 seconds thought well what's the, what's the point uh, i looked at couch for i think three seconds and thought what's the point i tried once to i tell you what my biggest problem has been mm -hmm. uh, which is a lot simpler now but that's actually setting it up in the first place um you know getting it to work uh, you know originally i uh, you know my obviously the application works on azure um, and I tried, you know, I tried to use Docker, couldn't get my head around Docker. Um, uh, you know, I didn't want to pay for a full virtual machine. So I tried this and I tried that. In the end, I discovered Raven HQ, um, which was pretty horrible, the original one. And then now that I'm on the, whatever you call it now, the new Raven HQ. Really big cloud. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, I don't have to think. I mean, I, as you know, because I complained loudly at the time, I was having a hell of a job, you know, setting up security and all that. And certainly, you know, I don't know, I haven't set one up for a while. So I don't know if that's improved, but that was the worst part, you know, setting up security. Because uh, I don't understand the security aspects of it. Uh. Yeah, that's. Uh, <laughs> I know that you keep saying that you're not a programmer, but I wish that. Uh, uh, you know, the programmer or DevOps who usually set things up uh, as upfront about their, uh, uh, the areas where they lack knowledge. We've seen some people who set up production systems and, uh, oh, here is the URL to my production system and I click on the URL and I'm inside a database. And why am I inside a database? Why is this publicly available on the internet with no password? Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, we, we put a lot of time on trying to improve security. Uh, well, I think it's, I think the, the visibility of security actually is, is the most important problem. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I know we've got no day, no B, no C. I still don't know what it does. I mean, I just stick to no day. <laughs> well, if, uh, if it helps, uh, let me will manage that completely for you. And uh, if the node goes down, then you don't need to know. You you don't need to know. You don't. Blah, blah, blah. You don't need to know about that. It's just so. Why tell me about it if I don't need to know about it? So. Because there are certain cases <laughs> where you do care. Uh, Thankfully, if you have very large databases, very a uh, large sure. or full request per second. Sure. Okay. Sure. Uh, yeah. Uh, I think that there are no uh, incoming questions. So, Jeremy, thank you very much for sharing your story. My pleasure. With us. And have a great day. Okay, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you very much indeed. Goodbye. Okay, bye-bye now. Bye. -bye. bye.